Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Hauser. I also go by Andrew. I'm a fifth year PhD student uh, at Stanford University, advised by Clark Barrett. Uh, and my co presenter is Teru, who is a visiting scholar in our group. And this work is uh, done in collaboration with uh, Alex and Feng Jun, who are the other two student uh, co authors and our advisors. So the topic of the talk is uh, towards certified robustness against real world distribution shifts. And I should preface uh, this talk by saying that it's a baby step towards uh, robustness against, uh, against real-world distribution shifts. Um, yeah, so like it or not, uh, adversarial robustness has been the focus of uh, a vast majority of the image classification and verification in the past few years. Um, there are several desirable properties. First, it is um, it sounds like we it, it's a desirable property, like the adversarial uh, ro ro robustness. On the other hand, it is uh, actually a very simple analytic um, form uh, so that we can specify them and encode them into some solvers or uh, encode them as uh, input polytopes to do bound propagation. So, um, and uh, to quote our keynote speaker, um, it is, step, it is a stepping stone to real robustness that we actually care about. So this um, work, however, is focusing on uh, taking a peek at what does it look like to try to verify real world distribution shifts. Uh, what we mean by that is um, it's still a kind of perturbation, but it's perturbation uh, that happens in the real world. For, for example, changes in weather condition or lighting conditions. Um, so, Usually these uh, distribution shifts tend to be non-adversarial. Uh, it's not like there's some uh, attacker that's trying to craft a noise. It actually like uh, it happens in the real world. Um, we argue that it is a practically relevant um, set of properties to, uh, to try to verify. One challenge is that uh, these type of real world distribution shifts are really hard to define by hand. So uh, part, like part of the reason is that uh, the inputs to uh, say image classifiers, they're pixels, right? So they do not really bear any uh, se uh, se semantic value. Uh, yeah, so it's really hard to, like for us human to write down a set of analytic formula to represent uh, changes in, 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 in like weather conditions. So uh, the question we want to ask um, is how do we formally specify and verify real world distribution shifts? So to do that, what we really need uh, first need is a generalized notion of perturbation. So uh, this is actually based on uh, some work uh, done by Eric Wong and uh, Zico Coulter. Um, so uh, in, in their work, they define a perturbation set uh, as a set of instances considered equivalent to a fixed instance. So this captures the standard uh, norm-bounded perturbation set. However, this also uh, tries to capture this uh, more abstract uh, real world perturbation set. The good news is that actually the research in, uh, in, in generative model has been focusing on trying to uh, capture this type of uh, more complex perturbations. So uh, in particular, the key idea is that we want to embed uh, the perturbation using a latent variable. So a simple graph illustration would look like something like this. We want to, uh, we have a more complex uh, a real world perturbations, but we want to embed it into some lower la uh, latent variable so that we can reason about the, um, uh, like so, so that we can reason about the effect of perturbing this particular latent variable. So the idea is, uh, the first idea is that uh, we're going to first try to learn this perturbation. In particular, in this case, we use a conditional variational autoencoder. So to uh, make this workflow uh, actually uh, work, we first need uh, training data. So the training data needs to be pairs of perturbed and unperturbed images. And then we're going to learn a, a CVAE to, uh, to represent the latent Gaussian variable that represents the perturbation. And then we're also going to learn a generator that takes in a particular image and this latent variable that represents the perturbation and then generates an image. So in this case, a perturbation set is essentially defined as the output set of the generative model. So this is the picture um, to, to, I guess, bear in mind. Um, we have a generator 
uh, and we also have an input image that um, we also have a prior network that essentially uh, takes in that image and produce uh, the corresponding latent variable. And then the generator will take in the latent variable and the input image and produce a perturbed uh, image. And by varying the value of uh, this latent uh, variable's value, we're uh, going to generate a, a wide range of perturbed images. So the next idea is that we're going to actually use this generative model as part of the specification. So um, in this case, uh, given a classifier C, uh, we essentially, uh, and also a perturbation set S, we're going to say C is uh, robust against this perturbation set. Uh, like what we make mean by that is that uh, for any uh, element in this perturbation set, um, the classifier will uh, classify uh, them uniformly and correctly. Yes, so um, yeah, so this is the specification. And it turns out that uh, we can actually just consider this concatenated network uh, of the generator and the classifier. So now um, it becomes actually uh, a, again, a, a robustness query against non-bounded perturbations on the, but this time on the latent variable. So um, yeah, so this sounds quite intuitive and also quite clean. Um, and uh, like, uh, I guess uh, at this point, it seems like we can just directly apply existing verifiers to uh, verify properties like this. More or less, this is um, true. However, um, there is a technical difficulty in that, um, those state-of-the-art generative models, they often use uh, sigmoidal activation functions in their architectures. And existing verifiers, um, also there are some talks uh, like throughout the day that we, we've seen, we tend to focus on piecewise linear activations. So the uh, study of these uh, like nonlinear activations is less. Um, and there's a practical reason to use sigmoidal activations in generative model in that we want to normalize the uh, output of the generative model to a certain range, say like from zero to one, so that uh, the output remains a valid image. Um, so Teru is going to tell you about our attempt on trying to reason about sigmoid uh, activations more efficiently. Okay, uh, this is still on, on the explorer area. Unlike verification of piecewise linear activation function, which has been intensely studied and admits complete techniques like branch and bound, verification of sigmoid has been less studied and more challenging. The only complete decision procedure we've seen is CAD, cylindrical algebraic decomposition. But this is doubly exponential decision procedure. It doesn't scale very well. There are a couple of other approaches that have been tried one is based on randomized smoothing, which gives us probabilistic guarantees rather than deterministic guarantees. The other sort of uh, main approach is one-shot linear over approximation. A common idea is uh, giving a shaped function on upper and lower bound like these green lines to get over approximation area. The drawback of this is susceptible to sparse counter example. Unlike for ReLU activation function, the solver cannot make progress when this occurs. So what's missing? Uh, in formal methods, there's a very nice idea called abstraction refinement. The idea is starting with coarse abstraction like this yellow area, uh, but, but then make a more precise abstraction on demand based on sparse counter example. Okay. Uh, I, will, I will present a meta-algorithm uh, based on uh, classic notion of SIGR, counterexample guided abstraction refinement. This key idea is to lazily and iteratively refine the abstraction by excluding uh, spheres counterexample so that we can continue making verification progress while keeping the state space small. I will briefly go through the algorithm one by one. So Procedure takes as input network M and property phi that we are trying to prove. Let's look at line two. We start with a sound abstraction. Uh, in our case, we use a linear, linear bounds on the sigmoid. And then we try to prove the property on the abstraction uh, area 
if we like to improve the property, uh, it's great. We are done because this this is sound abstraction, which means if it holds for abstraction m prime, it also holds for original problem m. But the property is uh, violated with Spears counter example. We need to refine by adding constraint that excludes Spears counter example. And then we try to prove the property on the refined abstraction again. Notice that uh, Seeger has three parameters, uh, abstract, proof, and refine. How to instantiate D3 is crucial to soundness and performance. I will briefly go over our design choices in the next slide. <clears throat> okay, the so first abstract function can be any sound piecewise linear over approximation. Proof can be any sound neural network verification algorithm that can handle piecewise linear activations and generate counterexample. Refine function is more intricate. What we wanna do is introducing a minimal amount of refinement to the abstraction. We don't wanna to refine too much because we run into scalability problem. And we want to minimize over approximation error. We want to do these two things at the same time and it should be easy to compute. <clears throat> okay, here's a graph illustration of our refine, uh, refinement strategies. Uh, essentially, a uh, counterexample can be excluded by piecewise linear bounds uh, with two linear segments. More, detail can be, more details can be found on our paper. Interesting observation is that the added piecewise linear function can be encoded as leaky level. This makes it possible to leverage, leverage specialized neural network verifiers. Okay, uh, we perform a set of experiments to know the effect of SIGAR. For the first experiment, we trained the generators on perturbation of MNIS and CIFAR 10. Sigma, in this case, sigmoid only appears on the output layer of the generative model. And then we compute the largest certifiable perturbation bound with linear search that can guarantee robustness. And then we picked the first 100 collectively classified test images. And then we compared with two baseline techniques. First is the popular DPOLY abstract interpretation, which is an efficient method to uh, compute neural network output bounds. And second is the poly plus branch and bound, which means we abstract sigmoid with the poly bounds and feed the problem a complete solver uh, branch and bound in this case. Okay, this shows the result. So we focus on shear perturbation for MNIST, uh, fog perturbation for CIFA 10. DP stands for the poly, BAB is branch and bound, the delta, uh, represents how much we can perturb and still maintain robustness. Namely, the larger the delta is, the stronger the guarantee is. So as you can see, SIGAR can consistently strengthen the robustness guarantees achieved by other two baseline methods. While the absolute value of the improvement in the uh, certified bound might not seem very large, the gain is uh, quite significant when we consider the increase in the volume of uh, certified latent uh, certified latent uh, space. This is also possible that we have reached actual decision boundary. Yeah, sorry, yep. So we are also interested in seeing how effective uh, the SIGER is on the canonical local robustness queries. We compared with Prima, which is more recent abstraction-based uh, method uh, that can handle sigmoid. And we use the same benchmark used in Prima evaluation. This is a set of image classifier uh, where every activation function is sigmoid. This shows, this table uh, show the numbers of verified instances by each method. Again, Prima, uh, uh, boost the verification accuracy of Prima. So this suggests that SIGAR can also be useful uh, when proving uh, general robustness. Yeah, I'll pass the presentation back to Andrew. 
Yes. So um, yeah. So now that we have a, a verification procedure that works reasonably well and better than the baseline methods, we apply it to actually evaluate uh, classifiers' uh, robustness to various distribution shifts. So we, we looked at the MNIST data set and the CIFAR-10 data set and a range of perturbations on it. Um, I'm not going into these uh, results too heavily, but um, I guess this is more of a proof of concept in terms of uh, like different ways we can analyze uh, the uh, robustness to dist uh, distribution shifts of classifiers uh, using our techniques. So uh, I guess one way is if we look at the same perturbation bound and then different perturbations, we'll see that uh, the same classifier will actually respond drastically differently uh, to different perturbations. So while it's a relatively robust um, perturbation uh, of brightness, it's actually not very robust uh, for perturbations uh, on, like such as uh, rotations. Um, we also look at uh, as we uh, increase the range of perturbation level, um, how the uh, like the robustness of the classifier changes. So uh, again, like for brightness, if we increase the delta, which is the perturbation bound, the robustness actually does not decrease that uh, uh, like uh, fast, but for rotation, it actually drops um, like it, uh, very rapidly. Um, yeah, so uh, information like this could be used potentially for retraining. So um, like if it's especially bad at rotation, then maybe we could add additional training data or like uh, find ways to try to make it more robust against these particular perturbations. Um, we also did other uh, experimental evaluation, uh, uh, like looking into the effect of different training algorithms uh, on these uh, robustness to um, distribution shifts, but I'm not going into the details of that. Um, yeah, so this is the uh, main content of our uh, talk. So uh, to conclude, we introduce a neurosymbolic approach for verifying robustness against real world distribution shifts. Um, and we also present a CIGAR, counterexample guided uh, abstraction refinement algorithm to reason about uh, sigmoidal activations precisely and sca uh, scalably. And there are a lot of uh, ne uh, next potential steps. The first is um, the uh, quality of the verification is largely impacted by the quality of the generative model. And it's actually, even though there are th uh, theoretical bounds about the quality of the generative model, it's important to also involve human in the verification loop so they, they can actually examine the counterexample found uh, in our verification and see, is this a real counterexample or not? And hopefully this could also be used to improve the generative model uh, so that we can do another round of verification. Um, another thing is we focused on the standard uh, data set, um, partially also because existing verifiers cannot handle a uh, data set beyond uh, CIFAR-10 and uh, MNIST. And, and, and another challenge is that uh, data collection is non-trivial um, because we actually need perturbed and unperturbed uh, data pairs. So um, these would be uh, interesting next steps to uh, to explore. Yeah, thank you for your attention. This is our time.